Welcome to Fan Counters. My name's Nick. And I'm Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, uh, last night I had a really bad issue happen. What? <laughs> No. Last night, we took the kids to go see, uh, like, a financial advisor with us. Okay. The meeting went well, all that. We're walking out, and uh, the guy stops me at the end, and he's just asking me questions. Kenzie and Maddie are right by me. Walk out the office door, and only Kenzie's with us. And I was like, huh. How do you lose a kid? I don't know. <laughs> I felt like I was in Florida with your situation with yeah. Lily just wandering <laughs> off. Like, where the hell is she? So I'm like, Maddie... Maddie, where are you? Nothing. Didn't hear her crying. Because usually if they get separated, they get nervous yeah. and they start kind of freaking out. So there's other businesses in this office. And I'm like, well, maybe she just wandered somewhere else. So I open the door. I'm like, have you seen a little girl? And they're like, only the one that was in the white shirt. I'm like, yeah, they're both in white shirts and they're <laughs> twins. So they look alike. <laughs> have you seen the other one? <laughs> Couldn't find her anywhere. I, was, oh. I, I actually was freaking out. I was like, "Did somebody just grab her when we weren't looking for one second Isn't and leave that with an her?" Awful feeling. I ran out to the parking lot just to see if there was any cars leaving the area, and there weren't. And I was like, "What the heck? Where could this kid be?" Freaking out. Everybody's helping me look. The, the advisor's running around. He's looking. It's her bathroom. And I'm somewhere? yelling their name. No, because both bathroom doors were open. It was so weird. I looked in, and um, she was in the car. She walked herself to the car, got in, and shut the door. Oh, <laughs> I'm sure there were some choice words spoken. <laughs> no, no. I was just, she actually was upset because she thought she did something wrong. She goes, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm like, I'm just glad you're safe. Oh, see, so, I would still yell at them. That's because you're a better oh, parent not, than I, I am. I did not yell at her. <laughs> I, I was <laughs> so, my heart was pounding so Oh, badly. I have done it where I have lost one and you, everything goes through your head in yeah. that moment. And all you want is that child back. Yeah. But yes, I have acted poorly almost every time I've gotten the child back. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, man. I'm not so good at stress with my children <laughs> when you, when I feel like they're in trouble, like going to mama bear mode. And then yeah. it takes me a little while to get off of that and unfortunately Lily is usually the bearer of Aww. me being too upset because I don't know what else to do with all those emotions like right. I thought someone just took my kids oh my Whew. gosh well, it was a lot of relief last Oof. night when I That's a heavy noticed her but it took a literally it probably felt like 10 minutes to me it was probably only two minutes but right. still it was a long two oh minutes oh my goodness gracious today on the show we're going to talk to one of the most patient people on the planet we'll tell you about that in a second first of all you can follow us on social media First of all, if you're listening to the show right now, thank you. Could you please subscribe so that it downloads to your podcast feed every week? And you could can... you like us and give us some stars? Yeah, give us some five stars. A little review would be great. But then you can binge listen to all the episodes. I mean, we've almost got 60 shows you, you can listen to. I actually had someone say that to me. Really? But yeah, that they were doing some project and they binged like all 50 shows. Wow. Mm -hmm. We are also on twitter and instagram at fan counters live and our biggest group thirty thousand strong is at facebook by going to facebook.com forward slash fan counters now today on the show we're going to talk with one of baseball's greatest players larry heisel was an outfielder that played with the philadelphia phillies minnesota twins and milwaukee brewers in 14 seasons heisel posted a 273 batting average with 166 home runs 674 rbis and almost 1200 professional games he led the American League in RBIs in 1977, just four in front of Bobby Bonds. In that same season, he hit 302 with 28 home runs. Well, that's a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> While playing for the Minnesota Twins on March 6, 1973, he, Heisel became Major League Baseball's first designated hitter. In the five at-bats, he hit two home runs, one of them a grand slam, and had seven RBIs. A month later, Ron Blomberg of the New York Yankees would become the first designated hitter as a regular season game. Larry Heisel was on the 1982 Milwaukee Brewers World Series team, but never got to play in the series. But he does have a World Series ring. We'll tell you how and why during the show today. Coming to you from nowhere near the entertainment capital of the world, this is Fan Counters. 
with Nick and Elizabeth on the Podfix Network. There was this mob of people, and they're screaming my name. Crazy fans. Stop following me. Don't come around my house. If you do, the cops are going to be at yours. If I'm having dinner with my wife, don't sit down at my table. Don't follow me into the bathroom. Can I take a picture? We're gonna, oh, my God. I think this guy wants to fight me. Ended up being a fan. I'm the only one that's ever been on Sam Jackson and lived to tell about Well, it. guess what? I have a big surprise for you. That's why we call it Fan Counters. <laughs> I don't think you're going to last on the air very long. Yeah. Larry Heisel, welcome to Fan Counters. Thanks for being here. It's my pleasure, Nick. Last night, was the Brewers clinched their fifth postseason berth in club history, and you've been a part of the postseason before. So what do you think the players are thinking and feeling as they wake up this morning? A feeling of excitement that probably 2% of them ever experienced or have or will experience. Nick, every player the beginning of spring training has a similar goal reach the playoffs and it is extremely difficult Uh, very few can do it but when you do there is a feeling of joy and accomplishment unlike anything that one could imagine much more important than individuals awards individual statistics so i know this morning that they are extremely happy with what's taken place did you stay awake last night long enough to see the celebration from st louis i did which uh nick is something that doesn't happen rarely uh my mornings start early i leave the house uh, oh a little after five so i go to bed early but last night i did see that playoff uh, victory, and my goodness, I had the privilege of meeting and spending time with those young men. So no one in the city is more excited with the victory than myself, having that privilege of knowing those young men and spending a great deal of time with them. That is awesome. It, you know, one thing it was really cool to see is when Bob Uecker came into that locker room and the guys started pouring champagne and beer over his head. Wouldn't it be <laughs> great to finally win a series for Euchre? Oh, my. Euchre is baseball uh, here, not only in Milwaukee, but the entire state of Wisconsin. And it would be fitting for Bob to receive accolades and and accomplishment this year. Um, I've been with Bob. It's really funny. Bob Euchre states that he's the worst player ever to play the game. (laughs) Nick, when I began, Euchre was on the Philadelphia Phillies. And uh, I have to admit, defensively, he was very good. Blocking balls, the absolute best. Balls did not get by Euchre. But uh, offensively, he had some challenges, like a lot of us. So uh, I have to disagree with Euchre when he says he's the worst player (laughs) ever. But hopefully this year we could win that honor for him as well as the city of Milwaukee. So in our show opening, we talked about some of your amazing career highlights, which we'll get to in a little bit. But first, I want to put your life and career in perspective by talking about your childhood. You had a rough childhood. Your family was on welfare and barely scraping by. And at 10 years old, you lost your dad to a brain hemorrhage and your mom a few months later to a kidney infection. How in the world did you handle this grief at only 10 years old? With uh, a lot of luck and uh, a lot of help, for two years following the death of my mother, there was not a child on the planet suffering more, had no siblings. Um, I was as poor as poor could be. Never had a man after my father passed away that would take me out to dinner or practice with me. I felt that life had as little to offer me as anyone. There's a story I share with my son or used to. uh, I share now with my grandchildren. At age 11, Christmas Eve, I remember like it was last week. Uh, I got down on my knees. I would tell my son to uh, say my prayers. And I said, Christmas Eve, my prayers was not for toys because I knew that I wouldn't get toys. My prayer was that 
I hope I don't wake up in the morning by knowing that whatever awaited me couldn't nearly be as difficult as what I was going through. And uh, luckily, the prayer wasn't answered. Now, where were you, after your parents passed away, did you go to social services or did you go to live with a family member? Uh, I lived with my mother's sister. And, uh, you know, I thank her so often. She was a relatively young person with her life to live. And um, I remember the beginning of the month, we'd get that welfare check as well as food from the government. And my wife did cook for my son the staple of my diet, and it was powdered eggs and powdered milk. And my son, after taking one bite, said, Dad, how did you exist on this food? Mm -hmm. But I shared with him, you know, son, over time you get used to it. You know, it was challenging, but my greatest joy when I turned 17, I'm sorry, 13, was the fact that I realized for 10 years of my life, I shared with the greatest human being ever to walk the face of the earth. And it was my mother. And I tell everyone, every accomplishment, every goal that I've achieved, every good thing, that's taken place in my life, uh, my mother's responsible for. What keeps me going is a promise I made myself that I know I can't keep. And, And that promise is try to make my mother prouder of me than I am of her. And uh, that's going to keep me going for a long, long, long time. You were named after Larry Doby an African-American baseball star who ended up making his debut with the Indians just two months after you were born. Did your parents see sports as a way for you to do well for yourself and therefore encouraging you to play them? My mother was enamored with baseball, and she was the one who named me after Larry Doby. Growing up, though, I don't think that either one believe that I had a chance to pursue a career in sports. Uh, My mother, more than anything, hammered education into me. I wish I could have kept the test, but in the first grade, my mother worked with me so much on math that the teacher made a special test. And after I took the test, she had me take it and show it to my second, third, and fourth grade teachers. And I look back at it, and I can't remember what was on the test, but I know in the first grade, it was probably some multiplication. Not difficult, but some easy multiplication. And I look back, and Nick, I tell myself, I was doing nothing other than what I was taught. I was privileged to be around the most charismatic hardworking, intelligent person on the planet. And um, I find myself trying to emulate my mother in many, many ways. Um, My father, before he passed away, he was sick for a long period. So I really didn't get a chance to know him. Hmm. Uh, My mother, I knew much better than my father. And she instilled in me a work ethic and values that to this day I treasure. And had not I been the son of Hubert and Claudine Heisel, I know that my accomplishments would not have been close to what I was privileged to to achieve. That's amazing. I mean, nothing means more to a parent than a child. Uh, I can't imagine my first graders doing multiplication. Oh, God, no. So the patience (laughs) that that had to have taken her to instill those skills on you so early, uh, what a remarkable thing for a parent to give a child. And and she was. She gave me so many thrills. I tell people, and this is the truth, 
uh, when my father became ill, there was a period when Nick every day, well, not every day, but every week returning home, there would be another problem. Uh, I came home one week and picked up the telephone to make a call. Dead silence. We couldn't afford the bill. Mm. Uh, a week later, turned the knob to get water from the faucet. Nothing. They turned off our water. We couldn't pay the bill. Uh, there was a toilet in the back that broke. We couldn't get that fixed. Uh, and yet my mother never asked anyone for a penny. Uh, she went and got a second job. And Nick, she had this wonderful way to make me feel like I was something, something special. At night, we would go to a spring where we would get water for the following day. And at the time, I didn't think about it. But as I got older, I, I would smile because my mother would make me feel like I was the true man of the house. She would say, Larry, I can't carry this heavy pail back to the car. Would you do it for me? Uh -huh. And carrying it back, you know, Nick, I honestly thought that I was the man of the house. And in many other ways, she made me feel so important that... It was an obligation. Let's talk a little bit about your career. Uh, you've got so many things that went right for you after that. Uh, in fact, you were not only talented on the baseball field, but the basketball court as well. In fact, NBA oh. superstar Oscar Robertson called on behalf of the University of Cincinnati, and you visited Ohio State several times with the governor of Ohio. So with so many powerful people trying to get you to play basketball, at the same time, you also had the Philadelphia Phillies calling you weekly. How did you make oh, that choice? What did you do? The most difficult decision I ever had to make, Nick, uh, my best friend to this day believes that I made the wrong choice. He felt that I would have been a better basketball player than baseball. And I do have to admit that growing up, Basketball was my first love. Um, I practiced and practiced and practiced and was very fortunate. Like you mentioned, the University of Cincinnati would invite me to the school often. Uh, Oscar Robertson played for Cincinnati Royals. They would take me to Royals games, uh, visit with Oscar Robertson. He invited me to his home. Wow. One morning before I was going to school, the phone rang and it was Oscar Robertson asking me if I had made a decision. Hmm. Uh, Ohio State, they were as interested, if not more, than the University of Cincinnati. And they would invite me there where I met uh, the governor, many of the uh, old, many of the retired players, um, Woody Hayes, uh, I met. And it was truly a joy. And Nick, I remember graduating and there was the first draft in 1965 for baseball. And I told teams not to draft me because I was not going to play. I was going to, you know, honor my scholarship that I received at Ohio State. Uh, the Phillies didn't listen. They drafted me in the second round, which to this day, I, I, I can't believe they did. I told them they wasted a draft choice. They would call Nick every 10 days and I would thank them. But I told them I am going to Ohio state three weeks before school was to start. They called again and asked if it would be okay if the owner and the general manager of the Phillies fly to Portsmouth where I was born and raised to talk to me about playing baseball and Nick, I will never forget my answer. I told them, I don't mind if they come, but I truly think they'll be wasting a trip. Nick, when I hung up the phone, that was the first time, and this is the truth, I honestly thought about baseball as a career uh, because I told myself if the owner and general manager of a major league team would fly to a city to talk to me about playing, 
then maybe I should give it a little more thought. Mm -hmm. And and like that night, I, my goodness, for hours, just reviewed what I thought were my strengths and weaknesses in both sports. And for the first time realized that maybe I should consider baseball, believing that Nick in basketball at about 6'2", I'd be a small man. Baseball, 6'2", I'm big. Yeah. Uh, if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky in both sports to play long, I could have certainly a longer career in baseball than, than basketball because of all the wear and tear. Mm -hmm. uh, I just thought about all my assets and and, and problems with both sports and decided uh, that possibly I'm going to have to truly listen to what they say. Nick, they flew in and they said things that convinced me that I had to give baseball a try, not knowing if I could play one day in the major leagues, but I just felt that I had to do that. In your second season of playing Class A ball, you had an amazing season and almost won the MVP award, but were edged out by Don Money. I mention oh. this because the 1967, the Phillies trade for Don Money, and after only playing Class A ball for a little while, you and Don make the opening day roster in 1968. Tell us about what it was like for you to, to meet him at that time or to, to be playing together. My greatest thrill in my athlete career was 1968 after playing class a ball playing with the Phillies, uh, Gene Mark, the manager who I consider the most brilliant mind in the history of the game. Gene came to me a week before the team was to leave to fly to Los Angeles to open. And I'll never forget his words. He said, Larry, you've done everything that we've asked uh, and more. Uh, I'm proud of what you've done. And he said that we're going to be leaving in one week. How would you feel about making that trip with us? And those were the most amazing words. And then I found out that Don Money, who I played against right. and was now teammates, uh, would be there as well. And Don and I became the best of friends. Uh, we roomed together. Don always criticizes me. He says, I'm an old man. <laughs> I'm three months older than Don. <laughs> so he calls me the old man. But I'll never forget that. When we started opening day, uh, we both were 20 years old and had played baseball for a very short time, mm -hmm. but it was a thrill of a lifetime. Take us back a little bit, and you, opening day is a very special day, obviously, but for you, especially at 20 years old, getting to step on a major league field as a player for the very first time, what was that day like for you? What were you thinking as you walked up those dugout steps? That my mother's dream was realized uh, being named after Larry Doby. Um, I knew that the one person in my life that would be the proudest of me was, was my mother. And I, I remember so many things that I would tell my friends about flying to Los Angeles. Um, when they paired up everyone back then, we had roommates. Um, the only two players that were left that were African-Americans that they paired everyone up was myself and Dick Allen. And Dick Allen didn't have the type of uh, reputation that they felt we should room together. Hmm. So I had a room all by myself, a big king size bed. I'll never forget. There was a chandelier. Uh, I thought that I was the president of the United <laughs> States. There were so many great things happening. And then opening day, and uh, Don and I, we both performed well. Uh, I went home that night and told myself that, my goodness, um, maybe after experiencing so many problems and, and challenges as a young person, 
uh, my life is beginning to turn around. So you were on the opening day roster for the Phillies again in 1969. You were having a great season until an injury limited you to just 23 at-bats in September. And injuries would actually hamper you a few times in your career. And as a player, you're only human, things happen. But when a player gets injured, there has to be a fear of maybe even losing your spot permanently, especially when you're so young. Um, you probably at that time had personal worries of income and providing for yourself financially. Is, does, is that kind of true as far as... When a young guy gets injured, are they worrying about that kind of thing? Without question, uh, so many thoughts entered my mind. Um, there was a period where I felt that life had nothing good to offer me uh, after losing my mother and my father and uh, the challenges that were presented to me. I didn't think that life had much to offer and then when things turned around and I injured myself, then I, re I was just reminded of what had taken place before. And maybe this was a part of what was to be a lifelong venture, problem after problem. So it, it was always a thought with me. And um, it, it's funny now, but I, I look back at my career and, and working with young people, I, I talk oftentimes about my career and, and tell them that what I've discovered, and I said, I want you to learn this lesson more than anyone, that hard times, that challenges brings out the best in all of us. If we're willing to work hard and address those issues, and one day it will define us in a way that will make us as proud of ourselves as we can be. So I tell them when those challenges occurred, don't be fearful. I said, uh, like I was many, many times, you look them right straight in the eye and tell yourself that I'm going to do whatever is necessary to guarantee myself joy and happiness. We're going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about some race issues, which I personally am a little in tune to. I happen to be Caucasian and an African American daughter. And so we understand that there are sometimes some differences that occur that shouldn't. Um, race issues came up during your career playing for the Phillies, who were at that time the last team in the National League to employ an African American player. It's reported that you made a public comment about your treatment that you were receiving. Do you feel that affected the treatment from your teammates, your coaches, or your manager? I remember that well. I, I think like every African American, you know, experiences racial challenges, uh, at times worse than others. Um, and there were times I, I would talk to my black teammates and um, I, I remember specifically a couple of times, once in class A ball in 67, and once in 69, where I told myself that um, I I'm going to quit, uh, that being African American um, should not bring all the problems that are, are associated with, with it. And uh, I said, I'm going to quit until I started to think about all the black players that played before me, the challenges that they accepted and endured. And I knew that they were probably four or five times more than I had experienced and realized that not only did I had to go out and try to address those issues for myself, but for a the black players that will come after me. Mm -hmm. So I would go out and, uh, and deal with uh, what I had to, even though I was young, not prepared. Um, and, and as I matured, I was certainly better able to handle all types of issues that were present in my life. In a move that seems somewhat kind of amusing now when we look back at it, 
during your time with the Minnesota Twins, the team had an odd number of African-American players, and so you ended up rooming with a white teammate. At the time, it was called the most progressive move in the franchise history. Were these publicized race issues a distraction for you or just something that the newspapers just had something to write about? You know, at times there were distractions. In Philly, I received uh, probably as much uh, hate mail as I did complimentary mail. Uh, when I went to Minnesota, it wasn't nearly as bad, maybe because of uh, the location. But it wasn't nearly as bad. And I do remember uh, my roommate, um, we talk about it, and I tell people that we might have been the first African-American and white player to room together. And he was one of the best roommates I've ever had. Uh, Mr. Danny Thompson, matter of fact, he wrote a book entitled E6, and he would carry a recorder that he would leave in the room and I would joke around and put things on there. Uh, but it, it was an experience that enlightened me, better prepared me for life in general. But I look back at it and tell myself, it should have been a, a part of professional baseball that instead of having African-Americans with African-Americans and whites with whites, uh, blacks would room with whites, mm -hmm. uh, Latinos would room with blacks to better enable people to understand everyone. Uh, as a team, you do spend a great deal of time together, probably more than you do with your family during the season. But I just believe that as a roommate, you spend much more time and you get to know the person in ways that you wouldn't otherwise. You mentioned before hate mail and that you had gotten as many bad letters as you did good letters. Did the hate mail ever make you kind of afraid to step out on that field um, because you thought somebody might act on a threat they may have made? Now, you know, that, that's an interesting question. I, I was never fearful that someone would physically harm me, but the, the letters were just, um, Nick, it got to the point in Philadelphia where if there was not a return address on the letter, I wouldn't read it. Mm. Or if it didn't come from uh, Ohio, portion of where I was at, uh, I, I wouldn't read it. And, uh, you know, some of my African-American teammates, uh, you know, did the same. It, it was truly unfortunate. And um, I, I know that the players today don't have to think about anything like that, but it was just, it, it was a difficult time during the sixties, which I consider for African Americans, probably the most challenging decade ever. Um, Nick in 1967 class, a ball Greensboro, North Carolina. I'll never forget it. Uh, before the game, uh, not at the ballpark, but not far from it. We could see it. There was a Ku Klux Klan rally, oh and it gosh. was publicized. And uh, clearly, some of the people went to the game because we could tell by some of the the language that that they would use. And uh, it was just a, a, an awakening that made me aware of where I was at and what I was doing. But Nick, what was so, I guess, unusual about the whole situation, I, I would leave there and I would be with my white teammates who treated me like I, I were 
the most important person on the planet. And, and Nick, as, as I live my life, and, and like to this day, I go to schools to encourage, and motivate, try to inspire kids, hospitals where children are suffering with some of the most challenging medical conditions. And color matters not one iota. Nick, there are classes where when I walk in, and this is the truth, kids will get out of their seats and run and give me a big hug uh-huh. 10, 15 at a time. And most of them are white. And it's my hope that those children, as well as every child and every person on the planet, realizes that skin color has nothing to do with a person's values or how they'll live their lives. Everyone is unique. Everyone is an individual that should be judged by who they are and not what color they have on the outside. Yes. Amen to that. Well said. Over a dozen teams pursued you in 1977 as a free agent, including the Yankees. But you chose the small market brewers. What enticed you to actually come to Milwaukee? You know, the brewers, they had a core of, of great players. And the city I loved. Uh, I remember telling uh, my son, my wife, that everyone in the family had a vote as mm-hmm. to where I'm going to play. And uh, my son, even though he was seven years old, knew a great deal about baseball. And he chose the Yankees. <laughs> okay. Uh, even when my wife and I uh, knew that we would probably be a Milwaukee Brewer. Mm-hmm. And I, I have to give it to Bud Selig, who was the owner and president. He did the best brainwashing job on my son I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> what did he do? Uh, How did he get him to change? Uh, he invited us back a number of occasion, uh, on occasions, and every time we would come, he would give my son every brewer item imaginable, from <laughs> baseball caps to jackets. But really what won my grandson over, he said, if you and your father and mother choose the brewers as your team, I will make it possible for you to sit right next to the basketball Marquette college team during the games. And uh, it, it happened. <laughs> uh, and, and that was enough to, to guarantee that uh, uh, we would be there. We came back it was during the winter. He invited us back uh, before we signed. And Hank Raymonds was the the coach of the Marquette Warriors who had played minor league ball. And my Hank would allow my son to sit on the bench every game that we attended. Wow. Would let, would let him attend practices. Uh, It was just the greatest relationship. So after Bud Sidley convinced my son, then my wife and I could, uh, let let our son know that we were going to choose Milwaukee as well. But it was a tough decision. It was really a tough decision. I don't think you'd have gotten that treatment from the Yankees. I mean, that's (laughs) just something that I feel like our franchise does really well is, you know, we offer this very family atmosphere in in Mm -hmm. in a Midwest town that has good values. And I think that that's would be attractive to somebody with children. Oh, and, and I considered the Yankees. Um, they were like an all-star team in 1977, 78, and, and years after. And I thought to be privileged to be a part of that would be something that I could never, ever, ever forget. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, one of my friends who uh, I sort of grew up with in the state of Ohio 
Uh, didn't know at the time we played in a high school all-star baseball game together, became the best of friends. Uh, Thurman Munson, uh, who I felt was probably one of the top 10 Yankees of all time. It would have been a joy to play next to him. I think you made the right choice, though. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. A career highlight for you must have come in 1977 and 1978 when you made the All-Star team. Tell us a moment about what it was like to be a player on that All-Star team. Wow. I, I think back to, to those periods. Um, I had reached a point in my career where I was judging myself harshly and criticizing myself for not getting more out of my performance. And actually the year or a couple of years before making an all-star team, I increased my workout schedule more than, than I ever thought I would. I remember times in spring training when you play games at one o'clock uh, at night, seven, eight o'clock, there'd be many nights I'd go out jogging uh, to guarantee that I'd be in the absolute best shape of my life. I did a lot of mental preparation in those years. And when I, I made those all-star teams, I, I realized that I was now beginning to play the way that I had always dreamed for myself. And I said, nothing ever can stop me from wanting more. When I made my first all-star team, I was so, so excited. But the second I realized that I was picked, I said, Larry, you know what you have to do? You have to make it again next year. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yes. And the same thing after that, after making that second team, that second all-star team, uh, I I'm traveling to play in the game in San Diego. The first was there in New York, which I loved. Uh, I'm traveling, flying to San Diego with my family. My only thoughts, it must be done again. It yeah. must be done again. And, um, you know, we're just so fortunate, so fortunate. Was it weird being on the same playing field, playing uh, alongside guys that you rival with during the season? Uh, or are you guys just all friends when it comes down to it and it's just a game? You know, the game has changed tremendously uh my second all-star game and, and i'll never forget that matter of fact reggie jackson said something that oh my goodness uh i, I thought that he's gonna get me in a lot of trouble but just before the all-star break the yankees were in town and when the game ended we flew to san diego together took the bus down and reggie was kidding uh, Goose Gossage uh, about how well I hit him. And I said, oh my goodness, uh, to myself, please don't talk like that. But, uh, <laughs> it, you know, it was, it was a joy. It, it, it was a thrill that um, I'll never forget. But the funny thing, though, like during batting practice, I remember being in the outfield and Gossage, uh, the pitchers would be out there. Gossage was, was not far from me. Uh, we didn't say a word to each other, uh, nor to the other players. We were proud to be there. And when the game started, someone would do well. We would certainly uh, give them a pat on the back. But we also knew more importantly than patting them on the back that after that game, we'd have to compete against every one of them. And winning during the season was just as important as winning that all-star game. So we didn't communicate as much as the players do today with one another. Okay. That's what I was kind of wondering. Now, Because you're at a game with some of baseball's greatest players. Are there any untold stories that you would have that you maybe witnessed in an interaction that somebody might not know about? Um, what story can we dig up from your mind so it's not lost forever oh. that might be <laughs> a, a gem? I know with me and and it didn't even happen. Um, my first All-Star game, we were, it was in New York. And 
my bag, I'll never forget, uh, we were getting off the plane, and Carew said that, listen, you know, I'll take your bag for you. And I'm not sure why uh, he said he would do that. But I said, okay, because I had my family there. And the next day for batting practice, uh, he left my bag in the hotel room. <laughs> Reggie Jackson walks over to me and said, Larry, listen, um, wear my uniform out for batting practice. And for a mere second, I thought about doing that but then realized that that would be a horrible, horrible mistake, so I, I didn't do it. Um, uh, that was a story that, that personally affected me. There, there were a ton of others. Just the mere fact that you are in a room with the best players in the league and arguably because they're either from the National American League the best players in the entire world. Uh, that was a thrill that stuck with me forever. And when I see young men play today and they're fortunate enough to be selected for that all-star team or any postseason performance, I give them all the credit that they truly, truly deserve. Last week was a huge week. For Christian Yelich of the Milwaukee Brewers. He hit for the cycle for the second time this year against the same Reds team, something that's never been done before. Now, you were the 180th player in Major League Baseball history to hit for the cycle back in 1976. Uh, what I'm wondering is, in that moment, when you accomplished that cycle, did you realize that you had done it? I, I did, and only because... Um a couple of players had warned me of it and Nick, and, and I'll never forget it. Uh, the last hit was a home run uh, in Baltimore. And when I did it, it was my, an accomplishment. I know like with Yellick that you will never, ever, ever forget. And it just brings back so many wonderful thoughts. I think of this young, uh, Yalek, mm -hmm. and I bring children that I work with to the ballpark. When I do, I don't ask players to come over. I know they're busy, but players know when I bring a child, they're suffering uh, medically or uh, impoverished. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, I had a kid who was having some true difficulties and Yellick came over. I love photographers. So I took pictures and Yellick talked to this young man um, to the degree that his mother called and she's been calling a lot afterwards talking about the young man's behavior and how he's changed and you know the impact that athletes can have on young people. It's it's just unimaginable. And I haven't had a chance to go back and thank Yellick for it. But um, I know I got off the subject talking about uh, hitting for the cycle and, and commenting about Yellick. But uh, that young man is performing in a way that I believe distinguishes the best from those who are really, really great. When I played, and I know the game has not changed, managers, players, we, prefer, we, we preferred players who were consistent over those who had those rare moments of excellence. Mm -hmm. uh, we like those players that day in and day out, irregardless of the situation or circumstance, would perform well, make those routine plays, um, whether it was bottom of the ninth, first inning, whether we're playing against the first place team or the last place team, as opposed to a player who would periodically perform great, but oftentimes fail as often as he would achieve those great performances. That Yellick is performing the way that everyone wants 
that consistency that, personally speaking, is the difference between the greatest of players and those players that, that are great wanting to reach that highest level of performance. And that young man's having a year that I guarantee you he'll remember as well as everyone in Milwaukee will remember for a long, long, long time. Well, those are the special players that do what you said. They perform consistently, but he has get, gotten a highlight reel this year that is unlike any other. So he's he's kind of the best of both worlds in that respect. He is, my goodness, hitting for the cycle twice um, in one year. <laughs> um, you know, most players, it's it's inachievable for them in an entire career. It's a difficult, extremely rare occurrence, uh, single, double, triple home run. Uh, that's hard to do in one game. Uh, for that young man to do it twice in the season against the same team is just unheard of. And um, I, I know that um, it, it's made him proud, uh, but not as proud as the people are of his performance, I guarantee now, you and I spoke earlier this month. Uh, we were at a Brewer game, of course. And the first question I really wanted to ask you was about your time on the 1982 Brewers. Of course, that team went to the World Series. And you started the season with the Brewers, but you played your final game of your career in May of 1982, missing those championship games. So you've told me this answer, but let's give it to our listeners why did your career end so close to playing in one of the biggest games of the year? Three shoulder surgeries. Um, Nick, after my first year here in Milwaukee, um, I had accomplished almost everything I wanted that year. Uh, I remember uh, my first year here calling Bud Selig and asking if I could come early with the pitchers and catchers. And he said, Larry, by all means. And I got there early and did that. Um, after having that that year that I always wanted, called him again mm -hmm. and said, uh, I need to ask another favor. He said, oh, what's that, to come with the pitchers and catchers? I said, no, to come before the pitchers and catchers, <laughs> about three days before. <laughs> and um, I, I was just so excited. When, when I talk to kids, and I do every day, I try to share with them experiences that have helped me that I know will benefit them. And I remember telling them, after every accomplishment that has brought me joy and happiness, there was always one thought and, and one question that I would answer and, and that question would be, Larry, what are you going to do now? And the answer would always be better than before. Hmm. And, and that's what I tell the kids, that we can always improve no matter what we accomplish. And in life, whether it's educationally, Nick, which uh, my wife criticizes me, but she's right. She says, I download more educational information than any person on the planet. And I do. <laughs> uh, but it's for a purpose to inspire these kids to achieve what they thought were truly impossible. And, and that's what I want for, for all the people that, that I'm around. Athletically, uh, when I played, uh, that was my mantra that no matter what I accomplished with hard work, effort, the right mindset, we can do better. And that was always my goal. And in 1982, uh, because of my surgeries, Nick, I was unable to truly participate in what I thought would have been the greatest thrill of my life, a World Series but I had to watch my teammates go out and perform. And to this day, it still hurts me. Yeah. Were, were you there for the games? Like, did they allow you to stay around the team during the playoffs or, or were you kind of on the couch at home like all of us? Well, I was 
just learning you know, how to use the potty at that me, time. But. but, but you know, Nick, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Uh, I, I had to stay home and watch it. It was tough. It was just too difficult for me to be with players that we had worked so hard to get to this point and not be able to help. And unfortunately, we are out of time for this week. But next week, be sure to tune in for the conclusion of this interview when Larry's going to share his thoughts on whether Barry Bonds will ever get into the Hall of Fame. He'll also give us his thoughts on whether the DH should stay in the major leagues or leave it. And also, will a woman ever pitch or play professional baseball? Stay tuned to find out. Yes, we'll be back next week with more Larry Heisel. Bye. This was a podcast from the Podfix Network. You can check out more shows like it at podfixnetwork.com.